Good morning aviators, welcome back to the Absolute Beginner Guide for the F-15C Eagle. This guide is designed for the beginner or new DCS player or someone who's wanting a refresher course. For those who are a little bit more familiar with DCS and this aircraft, stick around and you can contribute in the comments below. Today we're going to be covering cockpit familiarization as well as, as, well as instrumentation. So some basic information about the F-15C cockpit. It is a low fidelity model or non-clickable. You cannot click anything. The throttle levers do move and the stick moves, but other than that, this nothing else will move in the cockpit. The displays work, the instrumentation works, but it's interacted through key binds and joystick binds. So with that information, we're, we will get started by covering a left to right, down to bottom overview of the cockpit. So starting off, we have the VSD, the Vertical Situation Display, also known as the Radar Scope. This is our air-to-air -air attack radar. We don't have any air-to-ground attack radar, like the F-15E, I'm sorry, the F-18 Hornet. Got carried away myself. This radar goes all the way out to 160 miles from the aircraft, all the way to 10 miles in front of the aircraft. Its range is 70 degrees to the left, 70 degrees to the right, or 140 approximately in total. And it can be tilted up as far as, as far high or as far low as you want. Moving, most of the information for the radar will be covered in a different video. It's just too complex to cover in a short cockpit familiar, familiarization video. I have turned the HUD off because that will also be covered in a different video. So the next instrument display moving to the right this is the TEWS, the Tactical Electronic Warfare System, also known as the Radar Warning Receiver or the RWR. This gives us information about radar pings, radar locks, missile locks, missile fire warnings, and it gives us approximate scale. So the farther out, the farther away the target is that is pinging you, the closer it is, the closer the aircraft actually is. We have a couple of F-15 Eagles that are pinging us that I put them out there to show some information out there on the RWS. This will also be covered in another video, but it is called the electronic or the tactical electronic warfare system because it does have electronic countermeasure capability. Moving back over to the left, we will start with this system, the MPCD, the multi-purpose color display. Why is it called that? Well, I guess because it is in color and it has multiple purposes. Starting off with the top, we can see that we have fuel tanks. And if we look outside the aircraft, sure enough, we have three fuel tanks. One on the left, one on the center, and one on the right pylon. If we were to drop our tanks, they would just say pylon. I'll go ahead and do that now to demonstrate. Just pylon. The top left corner, we have information about our cannon, how many rounds, and the fire rate. So if I was to go ahead and select cannon with our modifier and the trigger button, we now have the cannon selected. Show you that it fires. It does fire up and it shows it counting down. So that is one function. We also have countermeasure information, so chaff and flare information. So if I use chaff, it'll count down. If I use flares, it'll count down. The other information displayed here is all of our missiles. So there's eight hard point attachment points where we can attach missiles. They include variants of the AMRAM, the Sidewinder, and the Sparrow. And we have all three on board the aircraft. So the top two and the bottom two represent what is attached to the fuselage. There's two forward and two aft fuselage missile positions. And sure enough, there's two in the front, two in the back, and then two on each pylon. These are what represent each pylon. There's the MRAM 120C on the left, left, the left side of the left pylon, the Sidewinder 9 Papa, that is the inside of the left pylon, and on the right side, it's an MRAM 120 Charlie on the right side of the right pylon, and a Sidewinder 9 Papa on the inside of the right pylon. Now, what's interesting is the Sidewinders show that they are a short-range missile, but all of the radar-guided missiles that are actually medium-range missiles just say standby. If we were to select one, there we selected an AMRAM, it says ready. That's the tone we hear if we have a 
Sidewinder, and it also changes from short range missile to ready. The Sparrow goes from standby to ready when selected, just like the Amram. And this shows that the infrared heat seeker for the Sidewinder is in the cool mode. Now moving just slightly to the left, correction to the right, we're going to talk about these three instruments. This is the indicated airspeed and Mach meter. This shows indicated airspeed in knots times 100, so we're just shy of 400 knots indicated airspeed, and we're just under 0.5 Mach. Anything above 200, you're going to start seeing the Mach scale. These change based on altitude as well as temperature and also indicated airspeed, so this Mach window goes up and down to coordinate for what is really happening. This is different than calibrated airspeed, which is shown on the HUD, which we'll talk about later. But mainly, indicated airspeed is the RAM information right from the pitot tube, while the HUD shows calibrated airspeed, which is indicated airspeed corrected for position errors and in, uh, installation errors. Now below that, we have the angle of attack meter, the AOA. This tells us how many units of AOA our wings are currently experiencing. Now the units are, do not equal degrees. It is approximately, again, approximately two units per degree. So, so right here we're approximately 13 units. We probably have about 16 and a half degrees of angle of attack. We'll talk a little bit more about angle of attack when we talk about our stall and spin recoveries. This is the accelerometer. The total G load on the aircraft. So right now we're in level flight, so it just shows us in one G because we're flying over Earth, so that makes sense. So I'm actually going to peek down here and show you something that you normally can't see. 7.5 is listed as the max G load for the F-15 Eagle. You can easily pull up to 9 Gs if you're light, but anything over 7.5 you're going to start getting an over G warning. And if you go any higher than 9, approaching 10, you most likely will rip the wings off. You also have a negative G load scale. Negative 3 Gs is the max for the F-15 Eagle. So now bringing the camera back up, we're going to be looking at these two. So I actually need to scoot up a little bit. There we go. Freeze that. We have the attitude director indicator and the HSI, the horizontal situation indicator. So starting, starting with the ADI, this, this gives us our pitch information, our bank information, whether we're going towards the sky or towards the ground, and also when we're flying ILS as it has a course needle. So how do we determine, actually let me turn off all that green lighting, I did that by pushing L, to see a little bit better. So how can we determine our bank using this instrument? Well, starting here we have 0 degrees of bank when this arrow is pointed at the top, then we have 10. 20 and 30 on each side of the median. We also have 60 and 90 degrees of bank. The blue is the sky, the ground is the dirt, and then we have the pitch ladder of 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 degrees, and it keeps going up. So if I were to take us off of active pause real quick. So now we're pitched up 5 degrees, now we're pitched up 15, now we're pitched up, I'm sorry, now we're pitched up 15, 20, 25, 30 and now we're in 30 degrees of bank to the right because our right wing is low I'll bring this back down to the horizon to make that point a little bit clearer so now we're coming back down to the horizon I'll pitch to the right our indicator shows us at 30 degrees of bank and we're in a right bank because our right wing is shown low towards the dirt or the black okay I'm gonna bank back to the left so we don't get that sun gleam in our eyes some other information we have a um, a, a turn coordinator, the little ball, so if I add left rudder that will make us uncoordinated and the ball will go off to the right. Basically you always want to step on the ball. We also have a standard rate indicator, so if I enter a right bank again, when that is lined up there we are turning 3 degrees per second. And we can also determine that by counting these out how many we're turning a second. We use that for standard rate turns and that's for instrument flying. Using a standard rate turn, you can make a 360 degree turn in two minutes. So now I'm going to make a bank back over to approximately 140. There we go. And put us back on active pause. That is how the ADI works. The HSI 
is a magnet uh, shows you your magnetic heading it shows you your course deviation it shows you a bearing to a station and uh, whatever radial you have selected and this is superimposed from the top down on a magnetic compass so your heading it will always show your heading at the top that never changes so approximately we were heading 135 and then we're 42 miles from wherever our waypoint is and the course to there is 265 now if I select the next waypoint we are 40, uh, it's going to keep counting up, so we're about 52, 53 miles from that waypoint, and it would be a 351 course from that previous point to this point. We also have this bar, which when centered up shows we're perfectly on track. This cross is actually pointing to the waypoint or station radial, so we actually need to turn around to get facing towards it. And then this is the tail flying away from it. Think of this as wings of the airplane flying to the point. These dots represent court course deviation. When this is full scale deflected left or right, and we are using waypoint or vortex information, we are 10 degrees off course at full scale deflection. If we are flying an ILS, a full scale deflection is only 2.5, and it gets increasingly more sensitive. Uh, it's actually two, two, yeah 2.5 degrees, and as you fly to the station, it gets increasingly more sensitive. But the um, degrees don't change it's just the difference between the different radials get a little bit closer to each other which makes it more sensitive which we'll go over in the navigation video we also have some standby display our knots our attitude and our altimeter information is also standby so now let's start taking a look at this white this right quadrant so starting off here, we have the altimeter, which by default is set to 2992 standard barometric pressure of, in inches of mercury. So we're at 8,500 feet right now. The big number here is our thousands of feet, and then the needle here shows us hundreds of feet in this particular altimeter. Now, there is no Coleman window to set the altimeter setting in, which I kind of do not like, but you can still change the altimeter setting. So when you're taking off from an airfield, you can go to Q, uh, QFE, which you just zero out your altimeter, and you're taking off from zero on the altimeter. That's the basic, very simplified version of it. So we can change that by going right shift and minus. So if I go right shift equals, that increases, and right shift minus, that decreases the altimeter setting. We'll leave it right about there for now and go ahead and level off. So that is how you can change the altimeter setting. That's also listed in your controls menu. Here we have the two engine tachometers which shows us total RPM and they do not change so let me take off active pause again. Maybe I should just leave it off. So anything above really 97 or 90, yeah 96 it, it tops out at 96 although it theoretically should keep going up when you're an afterburner but it doesn't we we have our fan inlet turbine temperature basically a good indication of the overall gas going into the turbine the fan turbine that is there should be a red arc here but it is missing anything in the red arc above which I think is about 10 that you're in dangerously high temperatures Next we have our fuel flow gauges for each engine and these are in pounds per hour. So the window here, we're using 11,300 pounds per engine because it's on each side per hour. So we're going to be using approximately 22,600 pounds of fuel per hour for our engines. I'm going to bring up here. Now this scale with the needle, you just, add at, you just have to add three zeros to it and you get the same information because we're just above 10, so 11,000, add three zeros behind it, approximately 11,000 pounds of fuel. Our nozzle position shows us, these nozzles can let you know if they are an afterburner. When you select afterburner, they go wide open, you can see it on the gauge. Close up. So they close up when you're not an afterburner, then when you select the afterburner, they really open up, in fact, all the way, and you can tell that position by this gauge in the cockpit. This is our fuel quantity because I dropped our fuel tanks. We are burning off of internal fuel. 
13,700 pounds internal fuel. And anything below 12, this needle shows you how much fuel you have, as well as this window here. So we have 10,900 pounds and decreasing amount of fuel. When you get down to about 2,700 pounds of fuel, these start indicating how much fuel you have in each side of the aircraft, on the left and on the right. The right side always has a little bit more fuel, and there has been a time or two where I have landed with a single engine because I ran out of fuel on the left. We have this little carrot here, and that is our bingo fuel. We can manually select that. If we go left alt D, that increases bingo fuel, let's say to 4,000 pounds. Then if we go left control D, well, we can decrease and put it back at 3,000 pounds. It looks like 2,500, but it's 3,000 pounds. This is the fuel, theoretically. Once we get to, we are done with the fight. We're going back to base or going to a tanker. This has no function. And if I go, oops, sorry. If I go a little bit lower, we have our cabin pressure altitude. The pressure of the air inside this cockpit. If this gets above 10, you need to descend down to... Um, prevent hypoxia. Okay, some other gauges we or instrumentation we need to worry about right here. So we talked about chaff. When we use chaff and it's going down, it will also give this warning for three seconds after we dispense. Same with flare. We start using flares. They'll give us a warning. So now I'm going to give both. I'm just going to use all we have. I'm going to show you what comes up the minimum. When we are low on flares or chaff, we will get a minimum indication. And then we have to verify which one we are low over here. Another instrumentation, the takeoff trim, which I guess I could theoretically set on the air, but using our control that we set, which is modifier and then the hat switch down, once you're in takeoff trim, that light will illuminate and you can't go any further. The last instrument, and I apologize for glossing over, the VSI, the vertical speed, indicator or the vertical velocity indicator that's what it technically is known as in the f-15 shows us our climb rate or our sink rate in thousands of feet per minute so if i pitch up get us a climb right there we're just over 2,000 feet a minute and climb tops out at six but just because it's at the top that that doesn't mean you're just climbing at 6,000 feet per minute you could theoretically be going 20,000 feet a minute and this reciprocal is true now we're descending about 2,200 feet per minute so we can time descents based on how far away we are from an airport or our station and maintain a constant vertical descent and get to the station at the altitude we want. Some other, other indications. I'll slow up here. So below 300 knots, I'm going to bring the gear down. So gear handles down and now they're coming. So we have gear down, three green. If those were not illuminated, we do not have three gear down and locked. Now I'm going to bring the flaps down by using the flap control. Yellow amber means the flaps are in transit, and green means that the flaps are in landing position. And that's it. We have covered everything we need to know about cockpit familiarization and instruments before we start flying the aircraft. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful in any way, please leave a like. If you'd like to see future videos, please subscribe. If you have questions or need help, leave a comment and I'll try to assist you. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the skies.